Zonta International once again presents the Remarkable Women Powerful Stories webinar series and I welcome you to my conversation with Georgie Somerset. Georgie is an industry leader and strategist with Boundless Energy based on a family-run multi-generational cattle station in southern Queensland, Australia. She's no stranger to thinking outside of the box, pushing through barriers and ensuring her voice is heard in usually male-dominated industries. Georgie holds a number of positions across the not-for-profit government and primary industries, including the first female general president of AgForce here in Queensland, and is the deputy chair of the Royal Flying Doctor Service Queensland and director at the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, around also with a range of other board positions like National Farmers Federation and the Foundation for Rural and Regional Renewal and the Royal Flying Doctors Foundation. So it is my pleasure to be in conversation with Georgie today. I'm Lynn Foley and I'm truly privileged to speak with remarkable women who are so generous with their time and their stories. I wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting today and acknowledge elders past, present and emerging and to pay that respect to any First Nations people present. Santa International is the leading organisation across the world, working together to build a better world for women and girls. So Georgie, welcome to our conversation today. Thanks, Lynn, lovely to be with you. So when I talked to you a little while ago, it became clear to me that your passion for the beef and agriculture industry and rural and regional community development and your skills as a leader and entrepreneur started very early in your life. I'd like to start today with where and how that story began. So Lynn, I grew up in the country. I lived in, our family lived in a couple of different places, but um, I was what I'd call a typical uh, rural child. Um, probably not, not as typical as something that we do do distance education and I did school on school of the year and I went away to boarding school, but that's very normal in rural Australia. And I think does does shape you, but it gives you a real chance to be involved in your family's business. And I look back on that time and think that um, we were so involved in the family property um, that it just became part of your DNA. And even though I went and did some other things, really that um, yearn to be in the bush was very much there. So I've only spent a couple of years of my life not living in a rural community. Mm. Well, so so in that very beginning of time, it, you believe it's, um, it's set the stage, I guess, for where you've gone in your life? I think so. Um, I'm the youngest of four children and, and our parents just got us involved in things. And so when I left school, I headed back to, um, we were living in outback Queensland and uh, we could see a real opportunity to let other people come and experience outback Queensland. And so I took a couple of school friends when I was 17 and actually set up accommodation on our station. And that was my first taste of running the business really for my parents. And I'd watch them run our business um, my mother always did the books and we talked about family business. We had family meetings, um, but it was my first experience and certainly of getting something off the ground. There was, there was nothing. Um, so we mm. had to paint and then we, you know, we and clean and we cooked and hosted guests. And I did that for a couple of years. And I think that was an amazing grounding in how to get a business off the ground, uh, literally from scratch. Um, but it also taught me some lessons about uh, working with people and, um, my, my style of leadership and perhaps sort of taught, taught me some things that I needed to work on as well at an early age. It's interesting you mentioned about being um, educated as often rural children are and still are with distance education or particularly school of the air. And given that many of the people who watch our series are from many, many parts of the world, I wonder if you could uh, indulge us with just a short description of that because it's still widely used across Australia in all states. It is, and, and these days a lot of the uh, lessons are actually on air. So there's a teacher working with you for several hours a day. In my time, our papers arrived in the mail um, and we, we had a set for the week, a set of papers. Um, and for half an hour a day, we would hop on air and on a, um, on a radio at that stage, not on a telephone or a, the internet. This was pre those things. Well, it wasn't pre telephones, but it was certainly pre the, the internet. Um, mm. And we would have half an hour session with the teacher and that would consolidate some of our learning. But really um, your mother or your governess, your home tutor were responsible for instructing you through those lessons. Um, 
and as the youngest, because the others were already at boarding school, I was very adept at cramming uh, a lot of that learning into a short period of time so that I could then help with shearing or mustering and be available when my siblings came home to be with them. Um, but I do think it teaches you some great time management skills. Um, it, it also allows those who want to do more to be stretched and to have individual. But the big challenge is always when you go from that very one-on-one -on -one learning experience to a large boarding school or a, a campus where there's maybe, you know, 500 people or 1,000 people. That's a big, it's a big adjustment at 12 or 13. Um, and I look mm -hmm. back on that time as being very grounding to travel a long way um, and you overcome a lot of fears to travel as a child um, and get to know people on a day-to-day -day basis um, when you've just been doing your own thing for several years. <laughs> <laughs> with, with what to other children would seem like a whole lot of freedom because other children who go to mainstream school, which is heavily timetabled, uh, they would yeah. view, <clears throat> I know I, I used to view it as that when I was, in a mainstream school and you met someone who was doing school of the air and I imagine during your time you were on the radio so you would have been having that radio conversation and all of the uh, vagaries of um, connectivity as we would call it now um, to, to make that work. Oh, absolutely and if there was a storm on my lesson was after lunch you know the, the younger children started in the morning so by the time we got to school you know, if there was a storm on it was almost useless being on the radio because of the crackling but you're right we did have freedom um, you know, I had, I had horses, I had my dogs, I, I had, um, you know, cubby houses down the creek. We had an enormous amount of freedom. Um, you know, you're living on a rural property, so you get to do things. You're given independence. Um, once you learn to drive, you have to learn to change the tyre because you have to be the one who actually is doing those things. And um, I'm, I'm really grateful that in my life I've been able to also pass that on to my children that they can have some sense of independence, um, not quite as remote and not doing distance ed, but... It is, you do have freedom and I think that um, also shows you when things can go wrong and you have to fix it up because there's no one else to, mm. to do it for you. Mm. Not, nothing better than learning to drive a tractor or learning to drive a car when you're 12 or 13 and you can change the wheel. Not, not of a mm. tractor, but you could change the wheels of a car. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and look, for me, I remember it was five miles to our front gate and um, I wasn't allowed to go and get the mail from the front gate until I could change the tyre on the vehicle and it was a small <laughs> vehicle um, but that was probably grade five so that gives you some idea mm. that you just you get independence very early on mm. 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 it's a great upbringing so thank you thank you for sharing that because um, given I grew up in the education sector very familiar with um, distance education and even in the radio times when I was first involved in education mm. so Let's talk now more about your agricultural business. Um, you've been involved in the industry broadly ever since you were, you know, very much knee high. And your current business in the South Burnett area of Queensland, which isn't all that far from where I am today in our capital city of Brisbane, is a true family affair. I'm keen to hear about the aspects of your business and how you've adapted technology or adopted technology as well to underpin that mm. success. Yeah, so I, I moved to the community in the, the late 1980s and I'm really fortunate that um, my husband's family, you know, embraced me into that business as well. Um, his parents are in their 90s and um, still very interested, so not actively doing the work but still very interested and shared their wisdom. So we've really, well, I feel I've benefited from, um, you know, 35 years of learning from them and working with them as well. Um, and then we have three children who are in their 20s who are all involved in business in some way. So one works in the business with us and runs one of our properties. Um, <coughs> one of our sons is in, works in finance and banking but um, has a lot to, to do with that side of things in our business but also comes home and does the physical work with his wife. Um, and my daughter as well is working in agriculture and she she's recently worked from um, works for a university but worked for six weeks from home so that she could actually be working on the property as well. So they're all really involved in the business and that's that gives us enormous um, pleasure as well. But what we've found too is that one of the things I think we've been really grateful for is that Rob's parents were able to um, enable us to, to be running the business and then, as you say, implement technology. So that ability to bring in measuring data, we start off with measuring your finances and making sure you know what's mm. happening in your cash flow and those sorts of things and what you 
you know, measuring what's happening out in the paddock, um, knowing what's happening with your cattle, but also combining that with this sort of what I call multi-generational knowledge of landscape um, and, mm. and how stock are performing on that landscape. And we have some really fragile soils and really the only thing they can do is graze animals and it's not suitable for sheep. So it, it's cattle or kangaroos really. Um, mm. And so our job as landscape managers really is to manage that tree grass balance and make sure that the, um, the soils are looked after, that we've got good grass cover. Um, and, and so no two years are the same. The fascinating thing about agriculture is that we are constantly working with the environment and the weather we get. Um, we've had some pretty crushing droughts, uh, but we've also had some good seasons and you learn as much from good years as you do from bad. Mm -hmm. um, but no two years are the same because it all depends on um, when the rain falls, when you have your first frost, um, how, if you have a heat wave. Um, and so, I, and that's one of the challenges I actually really relish um, is that you are constantly monitoring and thinking and talking. And as we've brought the next generation in, it's been a great challenge for us to think about how do we communicate and how do we enable them. Um, so there's some great technology coming through in Australia now. So um, we can, we, we have um, <coughs> cameras set up so that we can monitor water points, so on tanks or just actually so that we can see whether a, um, you know, a creek is flooded and fences need checking, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, we've also got a, a system where the cattle self-weigh themselves and so you get an average of what their weight is um, and that just happens during the day and we get a report each day. So I'm really excited about where technology is going to take things so that we can continue to evolve the business as well. Um, and that's what the next generation is going to really embrace, I think, too. It's it's quite exciting. It is, it is that next generation. Well, you're already in the next generation, effectively, but it'll be your grandchildren. It'll be really interesting to see where they take this whole notion of the... I think it's the alignment, isn't it? Or it's almost the congruence of technology in with um, anything agricultural because I don't think the industry was ever seen as an industry that would be embracing technology. You know, it's not something that was in people's minds, was it? No, I think that's right. And I think the other thing is that, um, you know, we've got to, globally there's a protein shortage and one of the really important things is that we actually use our resources really wisely. And so one of our focus is that we need to produce as much beef in as sustainable a way as possible. And so that managing the environment and monitoring things and being able to actually um, maximise what you're doing with the environment, I think is critical in terms of how we, uh, you know, as a saying in Australia, feed the world, but we, we are a significant export nation. And we know that there are countries that rely on our um, protein to sustain them and that's that's meat and grains and, and pulses mm. and things um but uh, you know it, it, there's a responsibility that that environment's going to be there and i i i watch that with my children that you know they're the third generation on the properties that we're running um but there was a fourth generation on neighboring properties sort of so it's it's fascinating and, and i go back several generations in my family where we can talk about the history mm. back in the 1850s of them settling um properties and i think that there is that you see that same thing in other industries. It's strong in agriculture, but I do see it in other ways where you pick up intergenerational wisdom um, because yeah. things are passed on inherently and you get an opportunity just to absorb it um, almost by osmosis, I think, as, as a family. Um, and you gain this wisdom from grandparents and people around you that if you're new to an industry, you have to actually work at that and develop those. And, and I absolutely see that happening and I'm really excited about young people who are coming into agriculture. Um, but I, I do think that if you have got wisdom in the past that you can gain from and build upon, it's it's really strong. And I think that yeah. works in any industry. I watch that in law, accounting, um, you know, the yeah. trades, builders. It, it, there is something about being able to learn as you grow. And I've noticed it in my world where I do a lot of coaching around the education and not-for-profit sectors at executive coaching and it's the wisdom that people are seeking that they're, they're looking to bounce ideas off someone who's gone before what is it standing on the shoulders of others um to go forward Georgie yeah, yeah absolutely and I'm conscious of that not only in our property in our family but in the, the work that I do I say that you know on a board you only you you are there for a short very short period of time you stand on the shoulders of those who founded and went before you and you hope that those that you that come after you can um, create an even stronger organisation. Mm. Absolutely. 
So I'll switch it, I'll switch it now a little differently. The next thing is you, I know that um, you were heavily involved in the Queensland Rural, Regional and Remote Women's Network. And for those people who are not from Australia, we talk about Triple R quite a lot, the rural, regional and remote space, uh, particularly when it relates to women, but in, in mm. all spaces. So in this Triple R back in the early 90s and also being part of Australian Women in Agriculture, it opened doors for your leadership and your advocacy. So I'm interested in your reflections, uh, uh, some short reflections on that journey. And, and it's interesting because it's 30 years this year um, since those organisations were formed. There'd been a um, farm women's network in Victoria for a couple of years before that, but really 1993 through to 95 was a real, um, I guess, gathering of women and I think a recognition. And um, so at that time, women couldn't be recognised in the Australian census as being a farmer. Um, in Queensland, they weren't on the state government primary industries database. You couldn't send; they couldn't send a letter to Mrs. or Mrs. or Ms. Um, you know, it was, the, women couldn't get finance to buy a property. I know women who were widowed who were sort of told they needed to leave because they couldn't do it on their own. So I think there was a real yeah. and 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 it came together. So there was um, Australian Women in Agriculture, and there was also some international Women in Ag conferences that happened around about the same time. I was in my mid-20s and I found myself a bunch of really wise women and we were just talking about that intergenerational um, wisdom before. I was incredibly fortunate because I um, I look back now and think, gosh, they were so brave to let me do what I did. Um, I had been working as a freelance journalist and running my own media consultancy business and they allowed me to be the media person and so I was putting words into their mouth and writing media releases nearly every week. Um, and what I gained was these women who had a deep understanding of policy and communities and regional development and not in a theoretical sense but in a very practical sense um, and for the founder of QREN you know she was um, Jan Darlington was completely sick of turning up and being the only woman at the meeting um, for natural resources or irrigation or dairying and she just said we've got to do something about this we've got to enable women to be involved and so for me it just opened doors to all sorts of things and although I'd been involved in setting up organisations prior to that for regional tourism and farm tourism. Mm -hmm. um, this really gave, this put me in touch. I mean, you know, we're sitting down with senators, working on policy pieces, um, you're working with the Queensland government to enable women to be engaged and involved and develop extension. And, and you're really in a partnership to try and do these things because it was as, mm -hmm. I guess we, we opened people's eyes to the fact that women just weren't included. They weren't even invited. So they couldn't be at consultations. Mm -hmm. and. This is only 30 years ago, so um, it was a really fascinating and there was a lot of energy around it. Um, so for me, I gained enormously from what I call the wise women who um, took me under their wing and but also let me free and, and let me be um, the person who was crafting a lot of the messages. Mm. It was quite, so, I look back, it was quite an amazing time and I, I actually didn't have the resources to be part of um, the international things. I never got to any of the international conferences. Um, I remember someone saying to me, you should just cash in your super. And I thought, I've been self-employed uh, for all but 18 months of my life. I don't have a super. You know, I, we, we, were, we just expanded our own business. And um, so I did what I could. I was a volunteer and you just learn so much from that. Mm. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's a learning here for women today, both women in perhaps your age group and mine and young women? What, what, what's the learning from that, do you think? Oh, look, I think it's really important to turn up. I mean, you know, you get invited to things and people probably won't invite you a second time. Um, so those who turned up to that first meeting got involved and we kept turning up. Mm -hmm. So we were meeting. It actually takes a lot of energy and a lot of time to do these things. And I think that's the thing, that this is not going to happen overnight. And I also think that um, you, you've got to commit to things. So you've got to be deeply committed and lose some sleep over it to actually make it happen. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I really encourage young women to get involved in organisations or causes that they believe in because that will be where they learn a lot of skills. Um, and they have this opportunity to learn from women who've been through the ropes and done this before. And uh, you, you do professional coaching. I um, mm -hmm. and, and I absolutely value and respect the coaching system, but I feel like uh, I just had all these coaches at that time that I hadn't asked for um, and really benefited from. Mm -hmm. I still remember my time as well, all the, the amazing, and there weren't too many women around education when I was coming through in the leadership roles. 
But I remember, mm. you know, often the coach or the mentor was a male or a female and how do you learn from the wisdom around you? And it's still the way it is today. Back then mm. at that time in the t rural town of Kingaroy, now this is where I do a plug. In 2024, there's Zontra International Conventions coming to Brisbane. And um, for everyone who's watching us today who intends to come to Brisbane, Kingaroy is in the South Burnett. And it isn't that very far from Brisbane. It's a place that I'd invite our international visitors to consider going to. Isn't that right, Georgie? Visit the amazing South Burnett. It's about three hours from the city of Brisbane and it's an amazing part of our state. And it's, it's a part of the state where you can experience rainforest and the most beautiful Bunya Mountains and, and incredible um, First Nations history that goes on there. You can get onto farms, you can visit wineries, um, but you can also visit um, some Indigenous museums as well. Like this, there's just this incredibly rich history around agriculture, um, natural environment, and there's, there's dams and fishing and all sorts of things. So, um, yes, do try and uh, A, come to Brisbane because it is an amazing city and yeah. we'll be hosting the Olympics as well, so you get there first. Um, but then do venture inland. We have beautiful beaches, but we also have beautiful uh, rural communities. Mm -hmm. I'm absolutely on that as well. So back in the South Burnett, in this rural town of Kingaroy, uh, back in the 90s also, you were part of a group of women who, who set up the Zonka Club there. Unfortunately, it closed at some time, but um, back in the 90s when you know, Zonka Clubs were happening everywhere. So how do you think your membership at the club gave you opportunities and um, helped you or empowered you and the women around you? I, I loved that period. So I think it was um, 94 that we got Santa in Kingaroy going. Um, and again, I think this was also this recognition that women wanted to be involved in something in rural women. So these were women, particularly in business. So I had worked on the, um, the weekly newspaper in Kingaroy. And so I did know people in Kingaroy and I'd, um, I'm very grateful to our region. It's a very rich region and I, it, it's been very kind to me. But I think what I got to do there was actually meet business women. And when you live on a property an hour from town, you go to town, you do your shopping, you have lunch, you head home again, you pick up parts and you know you trade, you know the people that you see in those businesses. But what you don't, who the people you don't meet are those that are doing the social service work, the lawyers, the accountants, the real estate agents, because you're not um, part of their social network. Mm -hmm. And so the the ability of Zonta to give you this professional network where you meet other thinking business women who want to have an impact on the next generation and their own generation is quite extraordinary. So we weren't around for a long time um, in Zonta Kingaroy and I, but I really loved it. So yes, I was a founding director. Um, it was an hour's drive. Mm -hmm. So going in twice a month um, to become challenging, but I'm really proud of some of the work we did. And we have a high socioeconomic, uh, sorry, a low socioeconomic and a high unemployment. So even back in the nineties, we had, um, we were doing significant work around ensuring there was a shelter for women uh, and, and keeping that stocked. Um, we also did work with um, young mothers. So we put the babies into the schools. We did a lot of education around um, teen pregnancy. We have a couple of towns where there's a very high teen pregnancy rate um, and has been for many years. So there was a lot of disadvantage. And I think that Zonta gave me an opportunity to get it, um, an idea of that disadvantage. And I think has also helped me to be more empathetic for our region and its needs going forward that I probably wouldn't have seen as a um, a farmer, a rural woman, an hour from town, but I got a real insight into that um, through Zonta and met some great women who were fabulous business women. And again, you know, I learned about running businesses from them and, and what they were doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very important. And I, I still get that from Zonta, of course. And, mm -hmm. and as I think most, most women and men who join Zonta. So I recall that you told me a growing family or the beginning of your family and a growing family contributed to the decision to leave. Now, many women have those similar experiences when they're trying to do this thing called balancing family mm. work and community involvement. And as you know, Madeleine mm. Albright fa famously quoted that women can have it all, just not at the same time. Not sure that's the truth, but certainly in her time, that's how she said it. Yeah. Since that time, there continues to be a lot of dialogue around families, caring for children, ageing parents, following a career. What are your thoughts on this topic? Uh, I think 
uh, I think we're becoming, so at that time, I think that I worked really hard and I, I burnt the midnight hour. So I had two children in under 12 months. Um, and so traveling two night meetings an hour with a baby for a couple of years all just became very difficult. I had a really good friend who was also lived near me who was a Zonta director as well. Um, so fortunately we carpooled, but she also had a colicky baby. So that was next level. But <laughs> when we got to Zonta meetings, everyone else could carry him around. Um, mm. So she sort of got a night off while she took the minutes and things. Um, <laughs> look, I think, you know, for me it was part of my identity was to try and have something outside of the property and the home and, and um, my brain was desperately needing it. And one of the things I was really challenged by was that because I had two children so close together, I'd also been appointed to a state government women's consultative council, which was doing some really interesting work. Um, we were we were in the middle of a drought, and I was doing off farm consulting work too. And my my mother and my mother in law were fabulous at travelling with me, or I, I found care in the towns that I travelled to. Um, so there was a there was a need for me. But people said you can't keep doing this when you've been doing this with the first one. That's fine. One's portable. One's easy. You can't keep doing this. And so I thought, well, okay, I've got to get off things, and I'll give. And, uh, and I went slowly mad, Lynn. I, I, and so I think that every woman has to find this path for themselves. So, yes, I did give up Zonta because of the, the, the stricture of the travel and the commitment, um, and I supported from afar. Um, I, I maintained some of my involvement with um, QREN. Um, but what I realised, and I say this to young women, is you have to navigate your own way because, for me, um, while I desperately loved my children I actually needed to use my brain mm. and at that stage our business um, wasn't needing me as much as it did in later years and I hadn't found my niche there but I really found it very difficult to just be stuck at home mm. and so I think if you are um, you know an articulate savvy have been very busy I think you have mm. to navigate this path yourself and you're right there are different times so I had periods where my children um, my mother died um, quite young in, in her 60s and so my daughter was only 12 months old and I really took the next few years off. I just, I had two children in primary school and I had a baby and I just thought, you know what, I just I just need to be here with my family and I need to ground myself and I need to get over this. And so for three or four years, I really just worked on the property, um, you know, worked with the PNC, worked with my local community groups, put all everything I could into um, those little lines and when my daughter was heading to preschool my husband actually um, saw an ad for something and while my daughter was very small um, I'd done the company directors course and my husband said I think it's time you know you could have a go at this and I also got to be on asked to be on another advisory panel when they were all in primary school which involved a lot of travel so uh, but interestingly I was away a lot when they were in primary school and people um, I found people quite judgmental of that um, that my husband was having to care for the children and he said well I am their parent and so I think <laughs> every every family navigates this their own way and what I love is that mm. my children like to um, do the washing and make their own lunches and get to the school bus um, we have a little school um, a bit under 10 k's away so they had to pedal to the mm. bus ride their bikes to the bus um, they became very independent because I wasn't there and the other thing is my husband got to do things that I would normally have done like regional sports or mm science day at school mm. that I would always have turned up to um but yeah. they saw a different model and so I feel like they and they questioned it at times why aren't you always here mummy you know and mm. you know the other families the mother was always there and the father was going away working and that's how I likened it mm. you know so and so goes away doing contracting I'm doing the same thing um mm. but families are very grounding Lynn you can be in some meeting providing advice to a minister at lunchtime and you drive home that mm. night and that's three and a half, four and a half, five from me. And I, you know, you get home and really it's just about what's in the fridge for lunch the next day. Like what's there for my <laughs> life? What's going to sign my form? They're not interested. So I love that contrast as well, that actually I go away and I do this work and I come home and I'm I'm mum and I'm on the farm and it's that's what I'm doing. Um, but I think and just, everyone, just like any other mum, it's like, yeah, oh, I haven't done the shopping or the shopping hasn't arrived yet or yeah, right, our kids, you're going to have to have this today because there's none of that and you get the usual complaints about whatever well, it is, I understand. I, there's a lot. We, we have a couple of tin cupboards and, and there's a bit of a joke in our family that we could make it through, um, you know, a, the, the plague. With, you know, <laughs> well, and, and, and during the, um, 
during the 2011 floods, we actually did. We were we were isolated for probably on and off for about six weeks. We used a lot of the tin cupboard during that time. So yeah, we do have tin cupboards <laughs> in the freezer. Um, but but I think it's important that women don't feel. Look, I did this because it actually feeds my. It feeds me. And even when I was at yeah. home, I was still reading voraciously. Um, you know, we did, we weren't online. So I went online in. Um, sorry, we were online then because I went online in 1996. So online made a big difference for me as well. Mm. Um, and but I think every woman has. We shouldn't feel pressured that we have to do something or be like the others. Comparison is mm. it's so fraught. And I loved the mm. um, the article I read once that you know. A plum is a great plum, but when a plum tries to be a banana, it's a really awful banana. Um, so just just be the plum, just be yourself. And I think we need to try and not place pressures on other women because of what our lived experience has been, but actually to embrace what their journey is. And you're right, um, ageing parents bring in another element and that's been part of, you know, part that is part of our lives. And I think we have to respect those periods. Um, when you've got a child in year 12, it is very difficult to take on extra projects because they are a whole project in themselves in year 12. Mm-hmm. So be, be realistic about the ebb and flow. But once they finish year 12, wow, you can, it's, it's amazing what you can doors do. Doors are open. Cool. <laughs> so, Speaking of I opening think... doors for us as women, Georgie, I'll just move us on to the next question if I might. I just looked at the time and went, oh, the time's moving on. So in our next question, it's about that involvement for regional and rural communities that you've had a lot to do with and so many women have in Australia. Um, leadership programs and leadership opportunities really targeting women from regional and rural community. Can you talk a little bit about your personal experiences and how you see women stepping into leadership roles as a result? Yeah, I think I think it's really important to invest in yourself and I used to do as much personal development as I could or professional development from home. Um, in the days of cassettes, Lynn, when we got cassettes. Um, but I I was really fortunate to do the Australian Rural Leadership Program and I'd watched it for years and I just had to find the right time when I could be away for significant chunks of time, you know, two weeks at a time when you are leaving um, a family and a property and a business. Um, but what that gave me, because I, I had sort of rushed through life and uh, deferred from university and you couldn't defer for more than a year back then and I was busy running that business in Western Queensland, I'd never got to uni. And there were times when I had that real sort of, oh, gosh, I need to I need to do that. I'm not good enough because I haven't been to university. Yeah. Um, and, and one of the things that I did at times feel that I lacked was that alumni around me that other people would talk about, you know, my mate from uni who does this. So the Australian Rural Leadership Program gave me an alumni who challenged me, hold me to account, but also support me. And, and it was a, a great experience. Um, and I mentioned I'd done the company director's course. I think... I think it's important to continue to invest. And one of my um, gifts back to the community from doing that leadership program is to establish a community leadership program in our region. And I just see significant impact on people when they gain an understanding of themselves and their impact on other people and how to work together in a team. So I'm a huge, I'm a huge advocate for investing in yourself and these sorts of basic leadership skills because I think they'll improve just your family life. They'll improve your work life and then they'll give you the confidence to find the leadership journey that's right for you. And that might be at the local school, it might be in your sporting club, but or it might be to go on to be an elected member somewhere. Mm. But every, pers- every person's journey is different, but you need some basic skills and understanding of how you impact other people. And I look back at my 17 and 18-year-old leader and know that I was a very flawed leader at that time, but I can still reflect on that and, and know that um, I, I've, I've I've polished a few of the edges of that um, roughness as I've gone through life, but it's also been about other people holding me to account and that feels really uncomfortable. And actually I think that in any of these leadership journeys, if you don't feel a bit uncomfortable at some stage, you probably haven't mm. dug quite deep enough. Um, there needs to be some real soul, soul searching about how do you operate. Um, and, and for women, I think it does empower them. I, I think it's important for men too. So I think we need to import in, encourage our communities to invest in leadership skills. Absolutely. So if I take it then to um, talk about the power of one's voice mm. and claiming the space to actually, you have to have a voice, but you also have to have a space. So 
what's some perhaps advice because we've talked a lot about how you got your voice we've we've covered it you know just in the questions we've done this morning but i'm wondering how what advice you'd give to other young women or all women about that how do you claim your voice and then find the space to use that voice I think it's a really interesting element too that we um it, it is about confidence and it's about understanding yourself and for me it's about knowing what is your purpose and what is it that you can bring to the the table um what is and thinking about the great pieces that you offer and what are the the skills and attributes you have and actually building on those so often we focus on what we can't do and you know, that was probably me with the university degree at one stage. Um, but if we work on that sort of 3% we're not great at, we don't get as great a result as if we worked on the 97% we're fantastic at, that it just becomes bigger. So I think find the bit that really makes your heart sing, that makes you energised, that you just, you are buzzing when you're doing that sort of work or um, in that space. It is different for everybody. And when you find that, do more of that, lean into that and have the confidence to turn up. Decisions are made by the people who turn up. Um, you know, the, things happen when people turn up. Don't be afraid to turn up even if you don't know anybody there. Um, it, it's really hard sometimes going to something where you know nobody, but maybe that will be the opportunity for you to break out of where you are um, and find what it is that really makes your heart sing. And I think deep down we all... <coughs> Have, we all know what it is, but sometimes we're so busy, we don't give ourselves the space. So I'd really encourage people to sit and sit in silence to think about what it is that makes, that, that is their voice. Um, mm. Busyness can often um, cr crowd in and make you, um, you know, you think you're busy, so that everything's fine. But in fact, that busyness stops you from being who you really want to be. Mm. Um, and you need to sometimes strip away some things and let some things go, jettison them, so that you can really focus on what's your voice and what's your purpose. I think sometimes too it is that busyness and it's interesting you've raised that, that um, we can crowd our lives with busyness because being seen as a busy person is somehow a construct that we mm. believe we need to have. But then you, somewhere along the line, we realise that busyness stops us from being the person we want to be, which is, I think, what you've just said, Georgie. And I, look, I'd like I think to, we have. Yeah, sorry, I was just going to say we. I think we glorify busy too, Lynn, and um, you know, and and it's there's lots of busyness, and we can be busy scrolling and all those sorts of things. But if we um, strip away and just have some of that calm, that's mm -hmm. when we really find who we are. Mm -hmm. And it's being busy on the right things to get the return on our investment of time, isn't it? So yes. now I want to take you to yourself just for a moment. What do you think are your greatest one or two leadership powers or leadership gifts? You as the leader, the leader in the boardroom, you're on many national boards. Um, you know, you're here in Queensland, uh, you know, well known in the industry sectors in which you play. So talk to me about your greatest leadership power or gift? I think it's about being able to bring together disparate parts and see similarities. And if I liken it, I think it's that I, I can be up on a balcony and I see, I can see what's going on in the big picture, but I can also bring together, um, I've never been terribly good at staying inside one uh, lane. <laughs> I've, <laughs> I've always had lots of different interests and I'm incredibly curious. That's one of my sort of natural inherent um, values is, to, is curiosity and I love learning. And so I've picked up lots of different information and worked in different areas. And even now I sit on boards that are in different industries and I find opportunities to learn from one industry and bring it to another. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not always about big and large organisations. Um, mm -hmm. You know, our smaller organisations during COVID mm -hmm. actually already had work from home and some of our bigger ones didn't, mm -hmm. the, the policies. Mm -hmm. um, so I think for me it's about that ability to <clears throat> think strategically, <clears throat> excuse me, about the long term um, and bring together um, sort of divergent views. Um, and for me, curiosity and positivity, I think, are both really useful in the boardroom um, because it gives me that opportunity to think about, well, who's not here and who aren't we hearing from? And, well, I wonder if we did that, what would happen? And just to keep asking questions. Um, mm. 
and and I think positivity has has held me in good stead in that we do have to find a way through. We actually do have to provide leadership. Mm. And there have been periods in my life when I haven't been so positive. And so I can completely understand what that is like for people. Um, but I work really hard on being in a mental space where I can be positive because I think that for leaders, we need to be able to see over the horizon. We need to be able to provide um, a vision for those who aren't there yet. Um, and we need to be able to bring together people to go on that journey with you. Mm. So following the path of curiosity and positivity, how do you think we could apply those, if you like, attributes or behaviours into, do, into doing more about getting to that 50% female representation, politics on boards, decision-making tables, which is referred to, of course, as gender parity. How could we apply that? And what's got to happen next to take us there, Georgie? Because we're a long way away, and I, I worry that we won't see it in our lifetime. Yeah, and look, I served for a while on the board of the National Foundation for Australian Women and we've done a lot of work and, and women on boards grew out of that organisation. I think there's some great work happening and the visibility of women is really high, but um, you know, the, the casualisation of women and things is also really challenging and, and what they retire with. Um, I think we've got to continue to talk about it. So the curiosity piece, keep asking the questions. Well, what would happen if a woman took on that role? Oh, um, you know, and I... I I think I guess I put a deliberate lens over it from my leadership perspective in that um, if there's candidates, where, where are the women? Um, who are we bringing through? Where are the, the women leaders? So I think you've got to be positive that we will get there. I, I agree. I think it's really challenging to see how that's going to happen. And with a 22-year-old um, daughter, I'm you know really hoping in her time. Um, but I think for women, we've actually got to be more than curious and positive. We've actually got to be, got to be quite firm. And we've got to value ourselves. We've got to go in and ask for those um, opportunities. As older women, and, and I'm certainly one of them now, we've got to be the ones who give the old me, the 25-year-old me, a crack. We've got to be prepared to step aside. We've got to sponsor other women. I try hard not to say no to anything. I say, I'm not able to, but here are three other great women who could do this. Um, go also mentor some young men, but it's... I do think that women are going to have to step aside and find another role for themselves and let young women come through <clears throat> because if we keep hanging on to these things, we might create opportunities for those women to come through quicker. Um, and it's important that we bring them through to senior leadership and CEO roles and CFO and CRO roles. They need to be in senior leadership because unless they're in senior leadership, they're not able to make those decisions. We need to make sure they don't get stuck in technical um, technical roles and, and aren't able to come through to board roles um, and we need to sponsor. So we need to to be their advocates. We need to, um, I love Kirsten Ferguson's um, quote where she said, let's not talk about a ladder, let's talk about a fishing net. Let's throw that whole net down and bring mm. those women up with us. Um, this is not about one or two and a linear thing. This is about how can we magnify it so that um, women, are, women are gathering in a network to celebrate not to have to constantly advocate and seek their place at the table mm. so that people don't comment and when there's a panel of four women on a sports show. They'd never comment when there was a panel of four men, but they commented to me that once someone commented to me the other day, there's a panel of four women. That's what they should be. They should have those opportunities. Mm. Um, and and I'm, very, I'm very proud of um, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, the ABC. We have a 50-50 commitment of trying to have 50-50 on screen. So, Women need to say yes to those interviews. They need to say yes to those opportunities to be in front of the camera. Mm. We need them to be visible because our young girls mm. can't be what they can't mm. see. What they can't see, absolutely. Mm. And, and it's incredibly important. And I think for those of us who are further down our careers than others, it's making decisions about when we become the advocate, when we become the person who opens the doors or uses the fishing net to go into your metaphor rather than being the person at the front. So there are times now I know when I'm saying, well, no, 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 there are these amazing young women in my Zonta Club, for example, and it's how do we encourage them to step forward to do the things that I might normally have done and support them if they want support, but otherwise let them fly. So I think it's really interesting I'm noticing as I'm in that other career stage, Georgie, about what your role becomes and should become. Oh. 
Yes, and look, it's challenging to let go, but it's also exciting because they bring um, new enthusiasm and we think that they're terribly young, but we were terribly young once and doing that for ourselves. So we need to make it easier for them and encourage them and support them. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So um, time is running away from me this, in this conversation, Georgie, so I've got two more things I want to um, em embrace with you quickly. One is how do you recover from those life challenges or work your way through those life challenges that hit from time to time? That's my second last question. And then I'll, I'll come and do a wrap with you. So um, the, the, particularly the women who watch our series are always interested in people's answers to that. Yeah, so I had that happen three and a half years ago. I was working in the cattle yards on a normal day drafting cattle. And um, by that night I was in hospital and <clears throat> I spent the next month in hospital. Um, so, you know, a cow gave me a tap on the leg, which um, smashed my tibia. And three and a half years on, it's it's there, but it's, it's mm. you know, I can walk and that's great. But there were times during that period where I wondered whether I would ever walk normally again. <clears throat> I, think it, I think it is all these things along the way that... At no stage did I feel any anger. Um, I just knew that I had to take each day as it came and I had to use all the strategies that I had. But learning from my early experience, I kept working. So I did board meetings from my hospital. I, mm -hmm. I read, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, kept, I stayed engaged because if I had just laid in bed <clears throat> and talked to, you know, just talked to friends for a month, I would have gone quite crazy. So for me it was mm -hmm. learning from the past so, so take your life experiences when things hit and dig deep. Um, but you need to know what your purpose and your values are and be working on things that are really passionate because that's when, 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 when tough times hit, that's when you're able to dig in and really overcome that um, because you believe passionately in what you're doing. But you've also lined up a whole lot of skills around you um, and you can... The other thing is that you also need to, when those tough times hit, be willing to ask for help. And that was probably the, the toughest thing for me, Lynn, was I couldn't even drive. Um, so I had, oh, yes. to, I had to ask for help. <laughs> it, was very, it was very humbling, um, but it's yes. also very empowering when you can um, work your way back from those moments as well. And, and I think that we all have much more strength in us than we understand. And um, given where you live, uh, you couldn't just call an Uber or a taxi to take you to take you where you wanted to go. You had to rely on people in family and on your farm. Uh, I recently had a, quite a bit of time on the bench, as I call it, and uh, I stayed here in Brisbane and, yes, um, asking for help. And, and when it's offered, actually accepting it rather than being a Mrs. Independent that says, no, 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 I'm good, thanks. It's, no, no, I actually need that help. And that, that's a challenge I'm, I still find, and I hear that you're, I hear it resonating with you as well. So, Georgie, mm. what's next for you? As you look at where you've come and, and where you're at in your life, personally and professionally, what do you think's next? Yeah, uh, look, and I do spend a bit of time, probably a bit like you at that stage, where you think about what, what is the next and where can I have impact? And I really love all my boards. It'd be hard to name a, a favourite child. And some of them have terms and some of them don't. Um, but I... One of the things I've really embraced in the last few years is not living, not filling my life so full that I can't embrace opportunities as they come. So I don't actually know what's next, and that's okay. Um, mm. The young me really struggled with not knowing what was next, but I really love that now because I would never look I, the opportunity to serve on our um, public broadcasters board has been a phenomenal privilege for me and to be reappointed to that mm. so I'm, I'm doing two terms on that board you know that's a huge privilege but at the time I wasn't expecting it it just came out of left field mm. and so um, I'm really determined to make the next period count and what I want to stay true to is those things we've talked about today um, adding value ensuring that when I do come to the table I bring something that's going to build that organization um, that I focus on enabling you know, other people to come through that I continue to advocate for rural Australia. Mm. Um, I just don't actually know where that will be, um, but I know that I have no intention of um, slowing down because there is there are great opportunities out there. There's great people to work with, and mm. I think I've still got um, a lot to offer. Mm. And um, rather than 
than trying to script it all. I'm um, really, I'm, I'm deep in what I'm doing at the moment and embracing what will come ahead. That's fabulous, Georgie. A closing thought. Just one closing thought for everyone today. I think be yourself, be kind and trust your instinct. The older I've got, the more I understand that as um, women, we have an amazing gut instinct. And if it feels right, it probably is. And if you don't feel right about that person, that organisation or what you're doing, then find a way to get out. Um, but trust yourself and be yourself. Thank you, Georgie. What a wonderful conversation. I've truly enjoyed spending this time with you today. And Zonta International thanks you. Thanks you for being our friend. Thanks you for being an alumni, if there's such a thing. And thanks you for your support of Zonta, but your support and the work you do for women across our country and in, in all the various ways that you do. So, and I also thank you so much for giving me your time. So go well and go safely in whatever it is you do next. And um, I'm very appreciative of what I've learned from you today as well. Thanks, Lynn, and thank you to Zonta for all you do. Please join me as the year progresses to hear stories of other remarkable women on our 2023 list. I'll be, like, be delighted if you can tell your friends, your colleagues and your family of our series and, and join us as we make a difference in the world for women and girls.